thank you so much for having our paper on the uh, program. This is joint work with Yi Ming Ma, Ivo Chuaxiang, and Nao Zhang, all of you are here. So in this project, it's great timing. We're studying the active management of passive funds. So in particular, we're studying an important and growing type of financial intermediary, oh, which are exchange-traded funds. Uh, ETFs manage over $7.2 trillion by the end of 2021 in the United States alone. Uh, you know, these intermediaries are often viewed to be passive investment vehicles. Indeed, the vast majority of these ETFs do track an index. And at the same time, these ETF shares, they trade on an exchange. And a benefit to investors is that they tend to be more liquid than the underlying securities that these ETFs may hold. So in this project, we're going to unpack these observations. But let me just begin by going over how ETFs function so that we're all kind of on the same page. So first, there's the secondary market for ETF shares. This is where buyers and sellers exchange ETF shares for cash, much like any equity security. And what's really unique to ETFs is how their primary and their secondary markets are connected. They're connected via market participants known as authorized participants, who are typically dealer banks who conduct arbitrage trades. So to illustrate how this works, imagine that the ETF share price is trading at below the value of the underlying portfolio of securities that the ETF holds. In this case, the authorized participant can choose to go purchase shares of that ETF in the secondary market and then go and uh, take that share to the ETF issuer in order to redeem a basket of the underlying securities that the ETF holds in kind and therefore get that arbitrage profit. And so this operation really serves two roles. On one hand, it's reducing any price disparities in the secondary market away from the underlying value of the ETF portfolio. But at the same time, it's allowing the ETF to manage its portfolio through, for instance, that uh, uh, these bonds are leaving the portfolio in the redemption basket. Similarly, if the ETF share price is trading at above the value of the underlying securities, the authorized participant can choose to go and source a basket of uh, securities to bring to the ETF issuer and uh, thereby uh, and create a new ETF share that it can then go sell in the secondary market to again get that arbitrage profit. So again, this is changing the portfolio composition of the ETF on one hand, and at the same time, it's alleviating any kind of differences in price from the fundamental underlying value of the securities. So we can see that authorized participants are really crucial to the functioning of uh, ETFs. To a first order, these creation and redemption baskets are the only way that ETFs manage their portfolios. And at the same time, authorized participants are not required to conduct these arbitrage trades. They do so in order to earn a profit. So within this kind of institutional setting, our first key insight in this project is that despite this image of ETFs as being these very passive uh, investment vehicles, uh, index tracking ETFs are actually remarkably active in their portfolio management, which again, remember, just boils down to the design of their baskets. And they're active precisely in order to facilitate the arbitrage trades of these APs when the underlying securities are illiquid. So they're active in order to facilitate liquidity transformation. In order to highlight this point, we build a Diamond Divvig style model where the twist is that we have ETFs and APs. This kind of highlights the key economic mechanism. And we test the predictions of the model using comprehensive data about corporate bond, index tracking corporate bond ETFs, where illiquidity and liquidity transformation is a big concern. What we find is that ETF baskets optimally include cash, even though you know, the indexes themselves do not include cash, and they also only include a subset of index constituents. Uh, moreover, if the underlying index is more illiquid, then the cash share is larger in these baskets and the tracking error is also larger. Moreover, as ETFs track the index dynamically by including and excluding bonds, they're less able to do this very well if the underlying index is illiquid. Our second key finding in this paper is that this active behavior of these ETFs spills over into broader financial markets. So specifically, it affects the liquidity of the underlying securities. Um, we, uh, we, in order to do this, we have a new identification strategy that uses bond rebalancing events. We find that in general, uh, inclusion in ETF baskets improves the liquidity of the bonds, but that this effect can flip during times of market stress when there may be imbalance between the number of redemption and creation baskets, such as during the COVID-19 market disruption. 
Re uh, relative to the literature, we are among the first studies to really focus on the key role of ETF baskets rather than holdings more broadly, and we highlight a new form of fund activeness. We show implications of this activeness for broader financial markets, and we hope to cast ETFs as a liquidity transforming financial intermediary, much like uh, banks or open end mutual funds. Moving into the model, we have a simple uh, model just to highlight the economic mechanism. So we have a diamond divig style model where the twist is that we have a tradable ETF rather than a bank. And we have not only consumption shocks, but also saving shocks. So in particular, we have three periods. In the first period at time equals zero, there is a mass of households that are ex ante identical with mean variance utilities. They jointly create an ETF. Uh, in the interim period, these households realize shock, so they learn who they are. They may be impatient consumers, in which case they want to immediately sell that share of their ETF. They may be impatient savers also, so they may have a windfall that they want to immediately invest in an ETF. Or they may be patient and willing to wait until T equals 2 to, to consume. If there is an imbalance of impatient consumers and savers, then a risk neutral uh, AP can choose if they wish to enter and clear the market by, by filling that gap. So specifically, the ETF at time equals zero is going to be endowed with an index. This is a set of uh, equal weighted uh, ex ante identical securities that are risky in that their time equals two payoff is random and that are also illiquid in that they entail both fixed and variable costs of dealing with. Given this endowment, the goal of the uh, ETF is to maximize agent aggregate expected welfare. And again, what does it have, what can it do to manage its portfolio? It can design this basket that is going to be traded by the AP in the interim period. Given that the bonds are all ex ante identical, this boils down to choosing a cash weight of this basket, which is a riskless and liquid security, and also how many of those N securities should be included in the basket. Uh, how do we solve this uh, framework? First, we're going to solve for the interim price at time equals one. Here, the key insight is that the AP chooses how many uh, shares of the ETF it wants to provide, and that has to clear the market. So through that, we can derive the market clearing price, which is simply equal to the NAV of the basket, plus, or, plus some premium or discounts from the point of view of the, of the AP. We can then plug that into the optimization problem of the ETF at time equals zero and rearrange to get this equation that really captures our key uh, economic insight. The first term is capturing liquidity transformation. That term in parentheses is the uh, imbalance in the interim period. And the, e the ETF wants to manage the price to you know, maximize that term. And so the, how does it manage the price? It manages it through the share of cash as well as how many securities to include, but that directly affects the second term here, which is going to be the index tracking. Uh, so solving this optimal basket uh, problem, we get that if the illiquidity of the underlying securities in the index are sufficiently large, then the ETF will choose a positive basket cash weight and a concentrated basket. And moreover, this cash weight and, this track, and the tracking error of the ETF will be increasing in the illiquidity of these bonds. So as a result, our model has some empirical content that we're going to test. ETF baskets should include cash and be concentrated. If the index is more illiquid, there should be more cash, more tracking error. And ETFs should dynamically adjust their baskets and cash to track the index but be less able to do so if the underlying bonds are illiquid. That's kind of our motivation for our title. So they're steering the ship towards the index, but they're less able to do so if, the, if it's illiquid. So the first part of our empirics is to test these model predictions. Uh, we use, as I mentioned, a rich data set on corporate bond ETFs, which are illiquid. Our corporate bonds are illiquid relative to ETF shares. And we have basket data. We consider two versions of basket data. First, we have the actual baskets that ETFs report. Um, and then we also have the realized baskets, which we impute from changes in holdings. The benefit of realized baskets is that these also include intraday negotiations. This is the actual next basket on a given day. Okay, using this data, first we're going to test, do baskets include cash? And we find across um, all of our different measures of baskets that indeed they do. So uh, they include between 5 and 12% cash. So ETF baskets include a significant amount of cash. Moreover, uh, we want to see if this share of cash is increasing in the illiquidity of the index. 
Here we use imputed round trip cost to capture the illiquidity of the index. You can think of this as a bid ask spread for, for bond markets, but we also do other measures in the paper. And we find indeed that as the illiquidity of the index is higher, the share of cash in the basket is also higher. Moreover, you can imagine that as the ETF is trying to track the index or just managing its portfolio, if it has more cash than usual, it will want to shed that cash and not take on more cash. So we can test this and we can see if this ability of the ETF to do so is attenuated when the index is illiquid. So here now we're considering three different measures of illiquidity and um, the delta cash deviation is how overweighted cash is in the ETF portfolio relative to trend. What we find is that when it's overweighted, the ETF is more likely to include cash in the redemption basket to get, get it out of its portfolio and less likely to include it in creation baskets, but that this ability is attenuated always when the index is more illiquid. So that's the second row here. Okay, moving into concentration of baskets. Uh, we heard that, you know, uh, these passive investors, they sample. So indeed, the portfolio holdings number of unique bonds is less than the index. It's around 80%. However, baskets are much more concentrated. So the uh, realized baskets have only around 30% of the unique bonds uh, relative to the index. So ETF baskets really include a small subset of the bonds. And finally, we want to see if this, uh, you know, concentration of baskets and the share translates into tracking error, and if this tracking error is increasing in the illiquidity of the index. We consider two versions of tracking error. The first is quite standard. We use ETF and index return. We also consider a second version to try to alleviate some concerns of stale pricing. So we directly construct returns based on our, the bond prices that we have so that any stale pricing is symmetric across the ETF and the index return, we look and indeed we find that tracking error of ETFs is increasing in the illiquidity of the ETF across both measures. Uh, finally, so ad analogously to the cash management, we want to see if when ETFs are managing their bonds to track the index, are they less able to do so when the index is illiquid? Here we're going to use a shock to how overweighted a bond is in the ETF portfolio because in general bond weights are quite endogenous. So we're going to use the fact that bond indexes rebalance monthly and uh, this is going to cause a shock to the overweightedness of those bonds uh, in the ETF portfolios. To illustrate this here we have again for uh, IGSB. Uh, the black line is the change in index, the sum of the change in index composition. We can see it spikes at these rebalance dates monthly. And the blue line is how different the ETF portfolio weights are from the index. And we can see they spike jointly. So this rebalancing induced overweightedness is a spike to, or is a shock to uh, ETF uh, uh, weightedness. And we use this and we see if when the bond is overweighted due to this rebalancing, uh, again, we would expect that the ETF is uh, more likely to include it in redemption baskets to get it out of the portfolio, less likely to include it in creation baskets. That's exactly what we see. And again, we see that the ability of the ETF to do this is attenuated when the index is more illiquid. In the last part of the paper, we want to see broader implications of this activeness for financial markets, in particular, the liquidity of the underlying assets. So uh, first, we think about an OLS specification where we're looking at the future liquidity of a bond that's included in the baskets of ETFs, and we're going to control for a rich set of controls and fixed effects. And what we find is that uh, in inclusion in either a creation or a redemption basket leads to subsequent improvements in the liquidity of bonds. However, of course, we want to do better in terms of identifying these effects, so we're going to reuse our shock that we used in the, uh, gen uh, in the bond overweightedness. Now for a given day, we're going to sum across all the ETFs that have a basket on that day and that have this rebalancing induced overweightedness shock. So uh, in order to create instruments, so we're gonna have a creation basket instrument and a redemption basket instrument. What's the intuition here? Our instruments take on larger values when these bonds are more overweighted in the portfolios of ETFs due to rebalancing. So what do we expect? We expect that these bonds should be included, again, more in redemption baskets, less in creation baskets, and that's exactly what we find in the first stage of our instruments. We can then use that instrument to look at the IV analysis, and we find 
uh, that it confirms the the original the baseline analysis that we had that inclusion and creation of redemption baskets improves the liquidity of bonds going forward. So far, I've shown you just kind of general. Oh, we have a lot of robustness in the paper uh, for a variety of different controls. And so, so far, I've shown you just general uh, the full sample effects. But we may we may expect that this liquidity effect is actually dependent on the state of the world. And indeed, uh, if we look at creations and redemptions over time, it's quite idiosyncratic uh, in normal times, but in bad times, net redemption uh, can tend to spike, such as during the COVID period. So we're interested in seeing if the effects vary across these different, uh, when there is large redemption pressure, for instance. To do this first, we zoom into the COVID period, and we again simply run our baseline uh, analysis, and we find that actually, during this period of large net redemptions, inclusion in a basket actually worsens the liquidity of the bond going forward. We can also do this in a more general uh, framework by constructing variables that capture basket imbalance. So here, for instance, the imbalance uh, creation variable captures how many more creation baskets there are on a given day relative to redemption baskets that have that bond. And similarly for the redemption baskets. And we can see how, uh, the liquidity of a bond depends on these imbalance measures above and beyond simply being included in baskets. So what do we find? Again, we find, of course, that being included in baskets improves liquidity overall. That's the first row. However, these imbalance terms attenuate that improvement in liquidity. And if imbalance is large enough, it can actually flip the effect so that liquidity can actually deteriorate, deteriorate for the bond when there's a lot of imbalance in creation and redemption. What's the, what's the intuition here? If there's a lot of one-sided selling or buying pressure on the bond, inclusion on, into dealer balance sheets is not going to improve the liquidity of that bond. So to conclude, we find uh, in this paper that seemingly passive ETFs are actually incredibly active in their portfolio management, and they're active precisely in order to balance these goals of tracking the index, but also incentivizing their APs and conducting this liquidity transformation. There is this state-dependent broader effect on the underlying asset markets, and this is simply highlighting one consequence of ETFs as liquidity transforming financial intermediaries, much like banks or open-end mutual funds. So thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to the discussion.